In 1835, a French philosopher named Auguste Comte was thinking about the universe. In his Cours de la Philosophie Positive, he wrote, On the subject of stars, we shall never be able by any means to study their chemical composition or their mineralogical structure. As we will see, Comte was also wrong about our abilities to divine the constitution of stars. Almost 200 years before Comte, the great scientist Isaac Newton took the first steps to unravel the nature of the heavens. In the 1660s, in his rooms at Trinity College in Cambridge, he directed a narrow beam of sunlight into a glass prism. Astoundingly, the white light of the sun was dispersed into the colors of the rainbow. By the early 1800s, Bavarian Joseph von Fraunhofer had refined the art of making high-quality prisms and combining them with telescopes. By dispersing the light from bright stars, he found similar rainbow patterns to that of the light from the sun. In the 1800s, health and safety rules were not as strict as they are today, and working with toxic metal fumes may have contributed to Fraunhofer's early death at age 39. Despite his short life, his precise optics helped us learn more about stars. He found that the rainbow of light had specific dark bands in its spectrum. While some of these bands had been noticed by another scientist, William Hyde, a decade earlier, Fraunhofer took it a step further by identifying nearly 600 individual dark bands in the light's spectrum. The source of these lines remained a mystery until the 1850s with the work of Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen. They directed beams of light though samples of gas, then dispersed them with a prism. They found that the passage of light through the gas had imprinted a series of dark lines onto the spectrum. Different samples of gas produced their own unique fingerprints of bands. It became clear that the dark lines on the spectrum of the sun were due to the various elements in its atmosphere. By the 1860s, the spectroscopy of other stars undertaken by William and Margaret Huggins revealed that more distant stars were also made of Earth-like stuff. Some astronomers observed the outer layers of the sun at total eclipse. Here, dark bands were replaced by bright lines. Kirchhoff and Bunsen explained that these were caused by light emissions from elements. Surprisingly, the light from the sun's atmosphere displayed a bright yellow line that appeared to have no counterpart in laboratories. In the 1860s, astronomer Norman Lockyer and chemist Edward Franklin concluded that something was missing from the periodic table of elements. They named it helium, after Helios, the Greek god of the sun. And by 1900, scientists had finally isolated this element in the laboratory. By 1903, they were extracting helium from under the ground, finding the first reserves trapped in rock under a field in Dexter, Kansas. They knew what it was precisely by its quantum fingerprint, exactly that found in the lab and in the sun. So Comte's prophetic words were shown to be wrong. Spectroscopy revealed the chemical composition of stars and showed that the heavens were built from nothing but earthly elements. With that fact established, the universe became a lot less mysterious. Presence of these unique patterns of elements in starlight helped us understand the universe, but we didn't know why elements had these patterns. Through the 1800s and into the early 1900s, chemists and physicists were starting to pry apart atoms, exposing their inner secrets. It is through their story that we will understand how astronomers were able to reveal the elemental makeup of the heavens. While the dark lines in the spectrum of sunlight did indeed puzzle scientists of the 19th century, the rest of the spectrum was also still unexplained. Why are there certain intensities for certain colors? In fact, the puzzle was far more intriguing than that. It was more than just sunlight that appeared to have a preferred spectrum. Every hot object, from glowing iron to burning wood, had a spectrum that seemed to depend only on the temperature it was heated to. It didn't matter what it was. If it was heated to the same temperature, it would glow with exactly the same colors at the same intensities. How could these lines in the spectrum possibly be explained if the spectrum itself couldn't be? Scientists were trying to explain how hot objects produce light. They thought that this light came from a huge collection of oscillating charges. This idea was based on what was known about electromagnetic waves. They needed to figure out how these charges wiggled to make the right colors of light. The solution came in 1900 with Max Planck, and that's when quantum physics started. So far, 
we have been traveling chronologically in time from the beginning of the universe to today. But we have jumped all over the history of scientific discovery. We have met some of the quantum cast, Einstein, Heisenberg, Pauli, Noether. But it's time to reacquaint ourselves with the father of quantum physics, Max Planck. His Nobel Prize in Physics reads, in recognition of the services he rendered to the advancement of physics by his discovery of energy quanta. In 1900, Planck put forth the quantum hypothesis that energy came in discrete chunks, the quanta, rather than as a continuous wave. While other physicists tried desperately to create a mechanism producing the characteristic spectrum of light, Planck tried some math tricks. One trick was assuming that energy couldn't be any amount but had to come in specific units, and that was the quantum. Planck didn't like this idea because it clashed with the classical physics of his education, but it worked. Soon, the idea spread to other unexplained phenomena, and quantum physics was out of the gates. Around the same time, scientists were starting to understand the structure of atoms. They knew atoms had a central nucleus with a positive charge and electrons scattered around it. One common idea was the planetary model, where electrons orbited the nucleus like planets around the sun, even though this idea had a problem. Moving electrons would lose energy and crash into the nucleus. This meant nothing should exist at all. So new ideas about the atom were necessary. At the time, the global center of research into quantum physics was in Copenhagen, in particular, at the house of Danish physicist Niels Bohr. Bohr, inspired by Planck's quantum idea, proposed that electrons couldn't be in any orbit around the nucleus, but only in specific ones. This prevented them from radiating energy and stabilized matter. According to the Bohr model, electrons can't be in between orbits, but can jump between them. When they do, they release energy as light, with the color being directly related to the energy. Since atoms have specific energy levels, they emit only certain colors of light, making each species of atom's light unique. Okay, let's recap. Orbits of electrons and atoms are quantized, meaning they can only have particular energies. They are discrete rather than continuous. For an electron to jump from a lower energy orbit to a higher energy orbit, the atom absorbs a photon with the right amount of energy to make the jump. This results in an absorption line at a specific frequency in the spectrum of light. When an electron falls from a higher energy orbit to a lower energy orbit, the atom emits a photon of light with a specific frequency. This results in an emission line in the spectrum of light. The sun's hot interior emits light of all colors, making it appear white. When this light passes through the sun's outer layers, quantum jumps happen. Electrons absorb and then emit photons in random directions, creating a spectrum with absorption lines. This explains both the spectrum seen when looking at the sun and the emission spectrum from other objects. Quantum jumps help us observe the unique patterns of atoms in the sun's atmosphere during an eclipse and in interstellar dust clouds. The discovery of the quantized energy levels of atoms gave birth to the modern era of quantum mechanics, and the understanding of atomic structure has revolutionized astronomy and cosmology. Every night, around the world, telescopes are trained on the heavens. Telescopes that aren't limited to the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum such as those using radio or millimeter wavelengths, can carry on observing in the daytime. Telescopes are really undertaking two main tasks. The first is imaging, literally taking a picture of the sky. We can learn a lot from these pictures, such as how many stars are in the galaxies and how many galaxies are in the universe. But if we look through filtered glass, where we can compare what we see in blue light to that seen in green or red, more secrets are revealed. From the color of a star, we can deduce its temperature, and from the color of galaxies, we can determine the life cycles of stars living within. The real power of telescopes, however, is spectroscopy. Glass prisms are rarely used, though. Modern astrophysics relies on devices called dispersion gratings to more efficiently achieve the same results. A great example of a dispersion grating is a compact disk. It can be incredibly difficult to see the spectrum even with a good prism, because the light has to be at a very specific angle and change media twice, air to glass, glass to air. 
But take a quick glance at a compact disc in almost any lighting conditions, and you will see a brilliant display of colors. What do astronomers look for in the dispersed light of distant objects? Well, this rainbow is rich in information about the source of the light, showing which glow simply due to their unique temperature, like stars, or display more complex emissions from superfast and superheated material, like the matter swirling around supermassive black holes in active galaxies known as quasars. Overlapping the rainbow-like emission from a source is the barcode of lines due to electron transitions in atoms. In stars, these are generally seen as lines of absorption, where atoms in the atmospheres of stars absorb well-defined frequencies of light due to their electron transitions. Sometimes, dependent upon the physical state of the atmosphere, electrons falling from higher energy levels emit photons of light, producing a line of emission rather than absorption. Quasars are some of the brightest objects we know of, observed right across the universe. With telescopes and spectroscopy, astronomers have been able to unravel the nature of these luminous beasts. At their hearts sit black holes that can be a billion times the mass of the sun. The black holes at the very center are, well, black, but surrounding them are rapidly rotating disks of matter. Heated through friction, these disks glow brightly, illuminating immense gas clouds that orbit nearby. This heating excites individual atoms, with their electron transitions resulting in bright emission lines, with prominent features from hydrogen and carbon. The light from these distant quasars has to traverse many billions of light years through space to get to us. This space is not entirely empty. Scattered among the galaxies are immense clouds of gas, mainly hydrogen, and, like most material in the universe, polluted with the heavier elements formed in stars. As the quasar light travels through the universe, clumps of hydrogen eat into the spectrum of light, leaving a pattern of distinct absorptions, their locations dictated by the ever-expanding universe. The way electrons move in specific orbits and release or absorb energy in distinct amounts opened a new door for astronomers. This provided scientists with the ability to determine the chemical composition of objects across the universe. The previously mysterious stuff in the universe turned out to be just like what we have on Earth, from the closest stars to the farthest reaches. Because it's the same, we could apply our earthly physics rules to understand how it works. From Kant's failed prediction about the unearthly nature of matter in distant reaches of the universe, telescopes, prisms, and oscillating and jumping electrons finally brought the composition of the heavens into our grasp. After the initial cosmic fires were extinguished, the universe descended into an eerie darkness. It was a time before stars. The hot soup of fundamental particles had been replaced by a tepid soup of protons, the nuclei of hydrogen atoms, and the nuclei of the few lightest elements. Accompanying these were free electrons, the temperatures being still too high for them to join with the atomic nuclei. After 400,000 years, in an event that astronomers refer to as recombination, the nuclei and electrons combined. This is a confusing title, as the nuclei and electrons were never combined previously. Gravity pulled matter together, pooling into regions of growing density and forming immense clouds. Within these clouds, the density continued to increase as the gas cooled, losing energy as it radiated. These clouds fragmented into massive chunks weighed down by their own gravity, undergoing collapse and forming the first clutch of protostars. Initially, these protostars glowed feebly in the darkness, heated by the compression from the ongoing gravitational collapse. Gravity continued its squeezing, and the protostars collapsed further. The central regions of the protostars were squeezed hard by the weight of their outer regions pressing down. The temperature and density within the protostars' cores began to soar, with collisions starting to bring atoms closer and closer together. Eventually, the densities and pressure reached immense levels, and electrons were torn from their atoms. Within this plasma, atomic nuclei were again forced close together, close enough for the strong force to reach out and bind them together. Nucleosynthesis began again, as the stars fused lighter elements into heavier elements. Through this forging of elements, energy was released. This nuclear energy radiated from the core, 
and through the outer layers of the star, providing a force that would counter the gravitational collapse and support the star through its lifetime. Roughly 500,000 years after the Big Bang, the nuclear energy burst from the surface of the first stars, illuminating the universe. The key difference between conditions in stars and the early universe is that stars lack the free neutrons necessary for making deuterium. In the early universe, protons and neutrons were equally abundant, allowing the formation of deuterium and subsequently helium. In stars, there are mainly free protons with a few other elements, but they lack the necessary free neutrons for deuterium formation. This is due to the rapid decay of free neutrons into protons, making deuterium formation impossible. Without a route to creating deuterium, it would appear that the first steps to powering stars is cut off. So just how do stars overcome this second deuterium bottleneck? The formation of deuterium is not the only bottleneck in forming elements in stars. Naively, you might think that all you have to do is crash lighter nuclei together to build a bigger nucleus, but of course, it's more complex than that. Some combinations of protons and neutrons, especially those having too few or too many neutrons, are unstable and fall apart in an instant. Also, if the collision is too energetic, a new, heavier nucleus might form. But the internal motions of protons and neutrons sloshing about might be enough to rip the nucleus apart into lighter elements. Given all this, it might seem that forming elements in stars is a tortuous affair. It appears to require seemingly impossible conditions just to get going, and then some just right conditions in terms of energy to proceed. So, while the Big Bang furnished the universe with the simplest elements, we still have to wonder exactly where all the other chemical elements, the ones that make up you and me, came from. To understand this, think of a high-energy mountain range. To move from one peak to another, you need a catalyst to change potential energy into kinetic energy. In this case, we only have free protons, as neutrons are mostly locked in helium-4 from the Big Bang. Consider, for instance, where you are sitting right now. One of us, we won't reveal which, is writing this sentence while seated on an uncomfortable bench. Perhaps you are happily nestled in a comfy chair. In either case, neither we nor you are actually touching anything. That is, your atoms are not touching the chair's atoms. In fact, at the atomic level, you never touch anything. How can that be? It all comes down to the electric force. The electrons orbiting your nuclei repel the electrons orbiting the chair's nuclei. Put as much weight as you want on that chair. You will never get the atoms to touch. The electrostatic force is that strong. Protons are positively charged and repel each other due to electrostatic forces, creating a steep energy barrier. This is where quantum physics comes in with a concept called quantum tunneling. Instead of climbing over the energy peak, particles can tunnel right through it. However, this is not an easy or guaranteed process. It's like a shortcut that only works occasionally, with small probabilities. This phenomenon is crucial in nuclear physics and chemistry. While it sounds strange, it helps us bridge the gap between classical and quantum physics, providing a powerful tool on quantum scales, even though it doesn't work on human scales. Suppose you have somehow ended up on an obstacle course. You are facing a wall. To win, you must get to the other side of the wall. Whether or not you are thinking about it that way, this is a physics problem. Your body needs to muster enough kinetic energy to match and overcome the potential energy you would have at the top of the wall. What about going right through the wall by quantum tunneling? Indeed, you could do that. There is a chance, by running straight at the wall, you will end up on the other side. But before you try, know that the odds are unfathomably small. You could run at walls your entire life, and even if you live to see the end of the universe, you probably would not have succeeded in tunneling. It might happen, but this is an extra cosmic scale bet. Also, it might hurt a lot. The chance of an object tunneling depends on a few things. How big the barrier is, how much energy the object has, how far it must go, and how big the object is. The larger the object, the less likely a successful tunneling attempt. By the time the size of the object is big enough to be visible to our eyes, the chance of tunneling through a barrier is essentially zero, close enough to zero to call it impossible. 
Thus, we never notice tunneling in our everyday lives of big objects. When you sit down on your chair, you know it is going to provide support. But if the rules of quantum mechanics applied on large objects like a human body, there would be a chance that you would occasionally pass right through the chair and end up on the floor or even below it. But for little things like protons and electrons, tunneling is the preferred mode of transportation. If you're going to write a superhero comic about tunneling, make sure your character is microscopic. We're starting from scratch, building elements from protons and neutrons. In the sun's core, there are only protons, which repel each other due to their positive charge. Sometimes, protons manage to get close through quantum tunneling, creating a temporary diproton. However, diprotons are unstable, so they need the weak nuclear force to convert a proton into a neutron, forming stable deuterium. This process is highly inefficient. To create heavier elements, quantum tunneling acts as a catalyst, helping particles overcome electrostatic repulsion. But there's a Goldilocks zone of energy, too much or too little, and it won't work. Atomic nuclei behave similarly to tennis balls, needing the right speed to stick together. In stars, gravity provides the energy to make this happen. If the energy is too high, they break apart. When the energies of interacting things match, physicists call this a resonance. Of course, the concept of resonance is not restricted to nuclear physics. In music, the hollow body of the guitar amplifies the vibrations of the strings. A different size or material would not do this in the same way, but perhaps so subtly that only an expert could detect the difference. The energy of the vibrations caused by the strings matches the energy of the vibrations allowed by the hollow cavity. In this way, your voice is also an example of resonance. Your body pushes air out with many vibrations. Your jaw, lips, tongue, teeth, and other organs change the shape of your vocal tract to amplify specific frequencies. Puckering up your lips doesn't create a whistle. It only amplifies the inaudible whistle from just blowing air. Everyone can whistle, but only some people can amplify it to make the sound we recognize as whistling. In nuclear physics, resonance plays a vital role in reactions, but it's often challenging to predict and measure experimentally. Scientists in the mid-20th century managed to predict resonances in the sun without computers, which was impressive. Sir Fred Hoyle, one of the most influential astrophysicists of the last century. As we discussed previously, he gave the Big Bang its name and is well known for his role in popularizing science and writing science fiction. In the early days of nuclear physics, resonances were hypothesized by necessity from the simple fact that we exist, the first instance of a so-called anthropic argument. For example, we know that carbon exists because humans, and many other things in the universe, are made of carbon. So there must be a way for carbon to form in stars. They calculated how elements are made in stars and found that a special kind of energy boost called resonance was needed for carbon production. In 1954, physicist Hoyle predicted this necessary energy level for carbon and encouraged experiments to find it. Experimenters had already found many resonances of the carbon nucleus, but a resonance at the particular energy predicted by Hoyle appeared to be absent. Hoyle was not one to give up, badgering experimenters to look harder. Soon enough, they confirmed Hoyle's prediction. It's fascinating to think that the carbon in our bodies and the oxygen we breathe were formed in older stars that lived for billions of years before our sun. Even heavier elements like gold were created in extreme, violent events at the end of stars' lives. The process involves getting nuclei close enough, overcoming barriers with quantum tunneling, and binding them together with the strong force. This process is responsible for everything around us. From the atoms to the sunlight that warms your skin on a summer day, all this is possible because of the quantum. Stars burn by forging heavier elements from lighter elements. The rate at which these nuclear fires burn depends upon the conditions in the heart of a star. Simply put, the higher the density and temperature, the more rapidly elements are transmuted and the more brightly a star can shine. For an individual star, these characteristics are defined by its mass. 
the more massive a star, the more gravity can squeeze the core to higher densities and temperatures, and the more energetic the stellar output. In the smallest stars, the ones that barely achieve the conditions to ignite their nuclear reactions, hydrogen is converted to helium in a very sedate fashion. With a mass only about one-tenth that of our sun, these red dwarfs glow feebly but have a hundred trillion years of fuel to burn through. Once the hydrogen fuel is gone, the core of the red dwarf is too cool to burn helium into heavier elements, and the star simply blinks out, cooling and fading into the darkness. Our sun, being more massive, can squeeze its core harder. It could burn through its nuclear fuel in a mere 10 billion years, but once the hydrogen is exhausted, a little extra squeeze can begin to burn helium into carbon and oxygen. This internal rearrangement will have a profound effect on our sun, causing its outer layers to swell and cool. During this red giant phase of its life, the outer layers of the sun will swell to engulf the orbits of Mercury and Venus and possibly outward to swallow the Earth and Mars. But don't worry, we have another few billion years before this radical change begins. Eventually, our sun and other stars with a similar mass will exhaust their nuclear fuel. The core will become too cool, unable to burn carbon and oxygen into anything heavier. The star will undergo more internal upheaval as the fuel is depleted, pulsating as the nuclear burning becomes erratic. In the end, the outer layers of the star will be puffed off in one final sigh. While the result can be spectacularly beautiful, viewed through telescopes as planetary nebulae, they are the markers of stellar grave sites. The life of a more massive star, several times larger than the Sun, can be yet more spectacular. The immense gravity of these large stars means the conditions at their hearts are no barrier to nuclear burning. Hydrogen is rapidly burned into helium, helium into carbon and oxygen, and then up into heavier and heavier elements. Very massive stars can churn through their nuclear fuel in a few tens of millions of years, constantly readjusting their internal structure as material created in one nuclear reaction becomes fuel for the next. A star about 10 times the mass of the Sun will spend roughly 10 million years burning through the hydrogen at its core, then about 1 million years burning helium. Burning through carbon might only last a few hundred years, while oxygen burning might be over in a few hundred days. The final stage, burning of silicon, takes a matter of hours. Then the nuclear burning comes to a grinding halt. The result of burning silicon is the production of iron, and iron has a special atomic nucleus. In iron, the protons and neutrons are tightly bound together. If you want to transmute iron into other elements, you need to put significant energy in to overcome this tight binding. This means that unlike other nuclear reactions that liberate energy and allow the star to shine, nuclear reactions with iron suck energy in. Once the star has a core of iron, the nuclear fires are completely extinguished. Without the radiation pressure pushing outward from the stellar core, there is nothing to halt gravity. The outer layers of the star free fall inward, crushing the now dead star heart. As they do, the crushing forces drive the temperature and density into extremes, and there is now enough energy to turn iron into heavier elements. The core of the star is crushed. In the most massive stars, this crushing is potentially into oblivion, creating a black hole, and the outer layers are driven off in a violent explosion. For slightly less massive stars, the result is an immensely dense dead stellar heart, known as a neutron star. During the immense squeezing of the stellar core, due to the collapsing outer layers, strange things start to happen. Protons and neutrons get packed together at such high densities that the strong force, which normally holds nuclei together, becomes repulsive, and the infalling outer layers are pushed outward as the star starts to explode. In this super-dense, super-hot environment, there is so much energy swishing around that even iron can be forged into heavier elements. In this case, we have one of the most spectacular events in the universe, a supernova, where light from one dying star can, for a few weeks, outshine the combined brightness of the billions of other stars in its galaxy. Supernovae are violent events, but this spectacular end to the life of the star is not dictated by the super-heavy elements created in the violence or the intense burst of high-energy radiation. 
Instead, it is caused by a tiny, strange, ghostly particle that is barely even there, the neutrino. How can this little piece of nothingness be responsible for ripping a star apart? Let's use a theoretical cake to explain this. You start with ingredients, weigh them, let's say it's one kilogram, bake the cake, and then it weighs less, 850 G, when it's cooked. This weight loss happens because some of the ingredients, which contain fluids, have turned into steam during baking. That missing weight is water, and you could capture it by cooling the hot, ventilated air from the oven. Now, why is this related to supernovae and physics? It's about the principle of conservation, specifically the conservation of mass. In the early universe, free neutrons turned into protons, but this seemed to violate the conservation of charge because protons are positively charged and neutrons are not. To balance the charge, a particle called an electron accompanied the proton. The electron was discovered before this process was understood. Physicist Wolfgang Pauli suggested that the missing energy in these reactions could be carried away by another particle, which he named the neutrino. The neutrino was finally detected in an experiment in 1953, even before the standard model of particle physics was fully developed. It turns out there are different types of neutrinos, but they all have no charge and almost no mass, making them very hard to interact with. They're often called ghost particles because they pass through everything, including our bodies. This concept of neutrinos is part of the standard model of particle physics, which is a concise summary of what we know about the fundamental aspects of the universe. It's a bit complex, but has been incredibly successful in explaining the particles and forces that make up the universe. Neutrinos are unique because they mainly interact through the weak nuclear force and gravity and are unaffected by other forces. They pass through us harmlessly, while other high energy particles like cosmic rays can potentially be harmful. Neutrinos are tiny particles created wherever particles fuse or decay. Billions of neutrinos come from the sun, generated during the fusion of hydrogen into helium in its core. In addition to neutrinos, high-energy protons also come from the sun. When cosmic rays, including these protons, collide with molecules in the Earth's atmosphere, they create even more high-energy neutrinos, which, like a sci-fi scene, pass right through everything, including us. Among this constant flow of neutrinos, we detect occasional spikes. These spikes indicate exploding stars. In 1987, a supernova event known as SN, 1987A was observed, and its neutrinos reached us before any observable light. How? Well, let's look at what happens in a massive star more than 10 times the sun's mass. As it nears the end of its life, its core collapses into an enormous ball of protons, neutrons, and electrons. In this chaotic environment, electrons combine with protons through the weak force, creating neutrons and producing neutrinos as byproducts. There are a colossal number of these neutrinos created in this process. Detecting these elusive neutrinos is incredibly challenging because they interact very weakly with matter. Scientists have created sophisticated experiments like Super K in Japan and Ice Cube in Antarctica to catch cosmic neutrinos. They place these detectors deep underground to shield against other particles and increase their chances of capturing neutrinos. During the SN 1987A supernova, only 25 neutrinos were detected, which might seem small compared to the many passing through your body. But these neutrinos carried an enormous amount of energy. They arrived hours before the observable light from the supernova, and their simultaneous detection at multiple observatories provided convincing evidence of their origin. Neutrinos also played a crucial role in the star's explosion, as they carried away energy that ultimately led to the explosive shockwave. Since neutrinos mostly pass through matter unaffected, they can escape from the dense core of the star long before other forms of radiation and matter, giving an early warning of a nearby supernova. After a star explodes, some of its remnants form neutron stars or black holes. Neutron stars are incredibly dense and have extremely powerful gravity. While they don't undergo nuclear burning like normal stars, the quantum world plays a part in their stability. 
how do we describe the entire universe? At first glance, this might seem like a very strange question, but to understand why this concept is important, we have to think like a physicist. What physics is and what physicists do can be a little hard to define, but it is useful to think of them observing and experimenting on the natural universe and explaining what they see in terms of rules and laws. In textbook terms, it is the observers and the experimentalists who probe the natural world with telescopes, microscopes, and oscilloscopes. Uncovering these laws is the role of the theoretician, someone skilled in the language of mathematics and how to manipulate equations to describe the physical world around us. However, this clean divide does not necessarily mirror reality, and many scientists have feet firmly in both camps. Isaac Newton, one of the greatest modern scientists, was skilled in both experiment and theory, as well as writing on alchemy and the occult. For our story, he is important because he was among the first to adopt a mathematical approach to science. Working in the 17th century and building on the insights of Galileo, Newton uncovered his three laws of motion, of which, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, is possibly the most well-known. While a novice student of physics will learn the wordy description of physical laws laid down by Newton, they know that the true power is in their mathematical form. In words, Newton's second law of motion can be stated as, the rate of change of momentum of an object is proportional to the applied force and takes place in the direction of that force. In mathematics, this is reduced to the much more compact and powerful equation. Through this math, you can make predictions about the physical universe. For example, if you want to send a space probe through the solar system to explore a distant comet, you will use Newton's laws of motion and gravity to ensure that the space probe and the comet end up at the same place at the same time. But the mathematical laws are only part of the story, and it is essential to know your starting point, or in the parlance of mathematics, your initial conditions, to make your predictions. Imagine you find a treasure map that says, walk forward five paces and turn left. Take three more steps and turn left again, then two more steps and dig. These instructions are completely useless if you don't know your initial conditions, where you are supposed to start and which direction you should be facing. Different aspects of physics require knowledge of different initial conditions. If you want to study the motions of planets and comets around the sun, you need to know each of their precise positions and velocities and feed that information into the mathematics. Then you can predict where the planets will be tomorrow and in the future, allowing you to make a fortune from accurate astrological predictions. You might chortle at this, but many of the motivations for accurately tracking planets across the sky over history were to enable astrology. At the end of the 19th century, science was coming to the realization that everything is made of atoms, and the gases that are the focus of thermodynamics are composed of an almost uncountable number of individual atoms colliding with one another and rattling around. Things like temperature and pressure are the manifestation of all this atomic jiggling. But was the devil in these details? In theory, if we knew the precise locations of all the atoms in a particular gas, as well as each of their speeds and directions, we could calculate their future paths and collisions. In that case, there would be no need for thermodynamics. But in practice, there are simply too many atoms doing their own things for us to conceivably calculate them all. James Clerk Maxwell, the originator of the equations of electromagnetism, also pondered this question. Thinking about the motion of atoms and gases, he wondered about the action of an imaginary demon, a tiny creature that can see every individual atom and know their properties precisely. The demon would also know the precise positions and velocities of all atoms and photons in the universe. It could then calculate the subsequent evolution of each of them. In the nice, simple universe of Newton and Einstein, the laws of physics are completely deterministic. All the demon would need to do is use all the current positions and velocities as initial conditions, and then use the equations of Newton and Einstein to tell us where all the atoms and photons will be in the future. Of course, there is no demon, and in practice, this feat would be impossible. But in theory, there is nothing in the laws of physics 
that forbids something that functions just as the demon would. Maxwell's demon, as a concept, has been argued about for more than 150 years, and debates still rage on. Its implications, that thermodynamics is tied up with the concept of information, has proven controversial. We all have an idea of what information is as a description of a thing or circumstance. Thermodynamics, on the other hand, is all about heat and energy flows. These two concepts sound so different, so distinct, that the fact that they seem to be intertwined seems, well, strange. For some, Maxwell's demon represents a step too far, and solutions are sought to blur the link between thermodynamics and information. Many proposals to expel the demon use our now trusted tool, quantum physics. Predictions appear much different when we consider the rules of the quantum. As Heisenberg taught us, a particle does not have a well-defined position and velocity. So this idea is already dead in the water, right? We know that the physical laws of the very small are governed by quantum mechanics, so we would need to account for this if we were going to calculate the evolution of the universe as a whole. And instead of positions and velocities, quantum mechanics encodes particle properties in the more esoteric wave function, and individual particles are not really individual, but are entangled with others. So a group of individual electrons is not represented by a group of individual wave functions, but a single wave function representing them all. Expanding this up to all the atoms and particles and photons in the universe, does this mean we can write down a single wave function for everything? Is the universe truly a quantum thing? The wave function is such a tricky concept to get one's head around that physicists still argue about it today. Entrenched camps each have their preferred interpretation. They even give themselves names like Bohmians, Everettians, Cubists, and Copenhagenists. But what is an interpretation of the wave function, and why does it need interpreting at all? For that, we will again revisit the early 20th century. As Heisenberg and others were developing matrix mechanics, which led to the understanding of the uncertainty principle, Erwin Schrödinger and his colleagues were working on what seemed like a completely different calculus for quantum physics. At the time, the physics of waves was well understood and wildly popular due to the wide applications of Maxwell's equations for electromagnetic waves. What is now known as the Schrödinger equation was an equation of motion for a phenomenon Schrödinger dubbed the wave function. An equation of motion, much like those of Newton and Maxwell, it followed the familiar paradigm of theoretical physics. Once the initial conditions were known, the equation did its work and predicted what this wave function would be for all future times. The story didn't end there, though. This wave wasn't like waves we are used to, carrying energy from one place to another. Nor did it somehow correspond to some physical property of the thing being studied, the location of an electron, for example. It was Max Born who demonstrated that the wave function could be used to calculate probabilities for the outcomes of measurements. The introduction of chance into the mathematics was unappealing to many, given the raging success of all the deterministic laws of physics that preceded quantum theory. You may be familiar with Einstein's lamentation, God does not play dice. However, it did encapsulate the same uncertainty Heisenberg found, so at least there was some consistency. In the end, Born's statistical interpretation of Schrodinger's equation was irrefutable and solidified quantum physics as a probabilistic theory. The confusion surrounding the development of quantum theory is difficult to appreciate from today's perspective. In physics classrooms around the world, students are given the Schrodinger equation and told that it will predict the outcomes of laboratory experiments. The wave function and its equation provide a recipe to predict, control, and eventually engineer materials. The homework assignments of physics students are filled with solving this or that manifestation of Schrodinger's equation. A common example is solving the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. The solution, which accurately explains the energy levels inside the hydrogen atom, is built of complex functions called spherical harmonics that produce the beautiful orbital shapes seen in physics and chemistry textbooks. Students are told that these are some sort of fuzzy representation of where the electron is, and it is left at that. For many decades, 
This metaphysical question of what exactly this wave function is has been responded to with the now infamous answer, shut up and calculate. Thus, by now, the prevailing attitude among a vast majority of physicists is that the wave function is a calculational tool only. But the curious mind is not satisfied so easily. To many practicing quantum physicists, there are two modes of operation. Given a well-defined problem, the quantum physicist will indeed shut up and calculate. However, when the calculations are done and the thinking begins, the quantum physicist is never entirely satisfied with even their own understanding of the wave function. Painted in broad brush strokes, the question can be raised in several ways. What does quantum physics tell us about reality? What part of reality does the wave function correspond to? Is the probability in quantum theory part of reality or our knowledge of it? Interpretations of the wave function are closely related to interpretations of probability, which can be neatly divided into two camps of thinkers. The first group considers probabilities to be objective. They are real. For example, when we say there is a 50, 50 chance a coin will come up heads, that chance is a real property of the coin, often called its bias. This is the intuitively obvious way to think about chance for a pit boss at the casino, who is trying desperately to identify those coins or dice that have been tampered with to weight the odds in the gambler's favor. For a large part of the 20th century, mathematicians and statisticians held this view as well. This in turn had great influence on the physicists and philosophers of the time. The second camp considers probabilities to be subjective. They exist only in the mind of the observer. In the case of the coin, it is I who assigns 50, 50 probability to heads, not the coin calling out its own unbiasedness. I don't know whether the coin is fair or not, so what choice do I have but to assign 50, 50 to the possible outcomes of a toss? To those holding the subjective view, probabilities are just numbers representing the private expectations of people. Though this interpretation has steadily been gaining popularity, among both statisticians and physicists in recent decades, there is still no consensus on it. These interpretations of probability are echoed in quantum physics. In the context of the wave function, one camp adheres to the view that it corresponds directly to reality. The wave function is considered a real part of the world for them. The other camp views the wave function as subjective. A wave function is something personal to a scientist, who uses it for their calculations and nothing more. There is no right answer here. However, if your inclination is toward an objective wave function, then you might also be seduced by the idea of a universal wave function. For if the wave function corresponds to reality, then the reverse should also be true. That is, all of reality, the entire universe, should possess a wave function. The idea of a universal wave function is not new, first appearing in the PhD thesis of Hugh Everett III in 1956. Everett developed the strange consequences of this idea. In particular, it led him to the infamous many worlds interpretation, which we will get to shortly. Others, including physicists like Stephen Hawking, took the idea of the many worlds seriously. This wave function of the universe obeys the Schrodinger equation, as all wave functions must for quantum physics to be valid. At each point in time, the equation tells us the wave function of the entire universe. Running the equation backward in time, we end up with the wave function at time zero. This must be the initial state of the universe. Wave functions can tell us all sorts of useful properties of things. The issue with any interpretation of wave functions is the role of the scientist, the so-called observer. The rules of quantum physics honed to be the most precise scientific theory ever devised, demand that the Schrodinger equation stop when the observer acts. When the observer acts, it's as if time is reset. The wave function changes violently and instantly, a process called collapse. It is often said that the wave function encodes the idea that everything that can happen does happen. Yet we, the observers, only see one possibility. The coin comes up heads or tails, not both. We collapse the wave function. How can it be, then, that the entire universe is described by a wave function if the action of a single observer can change it? For that matter, who or what is allowed to be an observer? A scientist? A rat? A politician? 
Ignoring the problem of the mind or consciousness, everyone agrees that humans are made of physical stuff. Thus, we too should be describable by quantum physics. Indeed, we ought to be part of the variables going into the universal wave function. But it doesn't appear that way to us. Enter the most controversial idea within the scientific field and the one most beloved outside it. The many worlds interpretation, initially proposed by Hugh Everett III, is the one idea from quantum physics that storytellers and filmmakers have wholeheartedly adopted. Who does not love a story where the protagonist ends up in a parallel universe, where the Allies lost World War II or the British won the American War of Independence? Apparently, historians dislike counterfactual history, but science fiction fans love it. Within the physics community, however, the many worlds interpretation is the cause of debates about as heated as academia can get. The many worlds theory claims that there is only one wave function, the universal one, which is always evolving according to the Schrodinger equation. Everything that can happen does happen. Since the wave function corresponds to reality, and it seems to encode multiple distinct possible realities, those realities must all exist, so the theory goes. Many realities, many worlds. In the many realities of the many worlds interpretation, there are observers with quite distinct perceptions. You could see the coin land heads, or you could see it land tails. According to the many worlds theory, both are equally real. From your perspective, say you are the observer who saw heads, the coin landing heads is the only reality. But the many worlds interpretation suggests that another observer exists, identical to you in all respects, except for the fact that he or she saw the coin land tails. Both are realities that play out in parallel, part of the large, evolving universal wave function. Before we close this video, we're sure that the viewer has raised their eyebrows a little with this concept of a single wave function for the entire universe. We have definitely strayed from what some would see as robust science into the realm of scientific speculation. Some would even suggest we forayed into scientific daydreaming. But in reality, we are hitting the murky interface of the language of quantum mechanics and that of general relativity. We don't know if we can truly describe the universe in terms of a wave function, but it is a speculative idea. At this point, it's time to leave the idea of a universal wave function behind and step into the apparently endless future that awaits the universe. This universe of tomorrow will be very different from the universe of today and we'll see that we have to rely on more speculative unions between quantum mechanics and general relativity to try to imagine what it might be like. In the future, gravity and the other forces will still be vying for dominance in shaping the universe. 